You're listening to the Real Estate Runway podcast, powered by Quattro Capital, where we are all about alternative business and investment strategies to help you amplify life and maximize wealth. Here's your host, the recovering engineer turned multifamily investor, Chad Sutton. All right, Real Estate Runway family. Today, we're going to have my friend Jonathan Twombly on the show today with Two Bridges Asset Management. Jonathan and I did an episode on his podcast a couple of weeks ago. So go check out Jonathan Twombly's podcast with Chad Sutton on it. You'll get to listen to that episode. It'll be linked in the show notes. We're going to have a conversation today about his contrarian investment view and playing in the mom and pop hotel space, which in his words, feels like multifamily when he got started back in 2012 timeframe. So I can't wait to get into the show and talk about some meat. He's a very sharp guy, used to be a commercial litigator and real estate attorney. He's a smart dude and lived through 2008 in that world. So let's get right into the show. Folks, if you get any value out of the show before we get into it, pay it forward. Like us, subscribe, leave a five-star review, whatever little app you're listening to this in, we're on all of them. Just interact with the show and say how much you enjoy it because that's the only way it's going to get to more people just like you. We don't advertise. We don't do anything like that to push the show. It's only word of mouth by you. So share the show, interact with the show. We appreciate you for it. If you might have some value to come on here and give to the Real Estate Runway audience, check us out at the Real Estate Runway podcast. I'd love to have you on. You can apply at, at thequatroway.com slash podcast on our website. And folks, check it out. If you are looking to earn a better return on your capital, and want to talk to Team Quattro about what that might look like for you in our real estate offerings and, and debt fund offerings, check us out at thequattroway.com slash invest. We can start to have a conversation, build a relationship, and see if this is right for you. Now, let's get right into the show. Here we go. All right, all right, all right. Real Estate Runway family, welcome to another episode of the Real Estate Runway podcast. I'm your host, Chad Sutton, and I am proud to have my friend Jonathan Twombly with Two Bridges Asset Management on the call today. I was on his show just a couple of weeks ago, and it's great to come back and have a similar conversation and bring a similar amount of value to you, the Real Estate Runway listeners. Jonathan, welcome to the show. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing great. It's funny. I'm so unused to being on this side of the microphone. I've been doing my podcast for such a long time and interviewing so many great people like you, and it, now it's, it's weird to be getting interviewed rather than being the interviewer. Yeah, yeah, it's good to flip the script every now and then. And folks, stick around till the end because we're going to talk about that podcast and where you can get some more massive value by listening to Jonathan talk about some pretty great stuff, especially the episode you and I did together, which I think is going to be the best one. But anyway. The best one ever, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so Jonathan, before we get into the meat of the show today, let's talk about you as an individual. You've been playing in this space for a long time. So- Let's talk about where you were before, what your entrance to the space was, and what your background has been up to present day before we get into what you're currently doing to find yield for you and your investors. Sure. I'll try to keep this as short as possible. But originally, I was a lawyer. I worked on big Wall Street law firms here in Boston, here being New York, Boston, and London. I was a commercial litigator, which essentially is a trial lawyer for Fortune 500 companies. And the last part of my career was actually spent as a litigator. So I did have kind of a real estate. I made the transition into real estate. God bless my firm. They kept me out for two years with no work to do, just sitting there collecting a $300,000 salary to do nothing for two years before they finally decided that you know, it wasn't worth paying me anymore. Um, when they decided that, I knew that it was coming and I had already mentally checked out of law anyway. I remember very distinctly having this moment where I was like, am I really going to go try to convince somebody to hire me for a job that I don't want? And I realized the answer was no. So I decided I wanted to break into real estate. I managed to find somebody who had some faith in me and took me on as a partner in a new syndication firm. And I didn't even know what syndication was at that point. I had thought when she said, we're going to go buy real estate and have investors invest in real estate, I just assumed we were going to be buying like brownstones in Brooklyn and fixing them up and said, she said, no, we're going to buy hundred unit properties in Louisiana. And I was like, how do you do that? And then I found out a hundred unit property in Louisiana costs the same as a brownstone in Brooklyn. And funny how that works. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> it's not that way anymore, but it used to be. So I just learned how to do syndications there and learned how to cut my teeth on the business. We ultimately parted ways after a couple of years. I founded Two Bridges in 2013, and that's when I started getting some traction on my own. I built a portfolio in the, in the Carolinas, which I sold in 2019. Then I, since that time, I've been doing a lot of JVs with other people. So I'm a partner in about 2,400 units, I believe, and it runs the gamut across the Sun Belt even into some new build stuff in um, South Dakota that we're doing. And then most recently, I have taken the leap into the independent hotel space, which uh, I really am, am excited about and happy to talk about that if you want. Yeah, I love that. And before we do, let's talk a little bit about you sold in 2019, which knowing what I know of cycles and what we've talked about here of, of the real estate cycle, folks, Jonathan has experienced before he got into real estate, what happened in, in 08, which that was the turning point of our prior cycle. And I, I want to bet as you syndicated some deals and worked with your other partner and then founded two bridges and bought the, the Carolina portfolio, eventually you decided to sell it. Probably had something to do with reading the tea leaves and trying to make an educated guess of where are we in the cycle and does it make sense to keep holding these assets. So let's maybe walk through that thought process a little bit, if you don't mind, of what drove you to go ahead and liquidate that portfolio in 2019. Yeah, I feel like I don't even really need to answer because you read my mind just now, but my, my whole thought process, but you're right, I did. I went through the 08 crisis as a real estate lawyer, right, and saw a lot of the fallout. A lot of the stuff I was working on was basically fallout from the crisis, right? And as I started building my portfolio, I was just watching the cycle kind of unfold and seeing not just the fact that prices had really risen and cap rates were com compressing and it was getting harder and harder for me to figure out, find deals that made sense. I also saw just yeah. this flood of people coming into the space. And at the same time, I was also, you know, at that, I think I did what a lot of new syndicators do when they start out, which is they look at ABC deals and they're like, wow, these C deals have really good cap rates. Like I'm going to buy those because I'm going to make the most money. Right. And they don't really realize that there's a whole special skill set that comes with owning C properties. We were, we, our portfolio ran the gamut from like amazing to what's the problem today kind Fair. of thing. <laughs> and, but one thing that we did notice was that on the weaker properties, we were having collections issues all the time, right? We just, we did all of the background checks and we did all of the credit checks and we did all the everything. And yet it was like pulling teeth to try to get our tenants to pay us on time or pay us at all. And, and that was not to mention all the physical problems that come up on, on an older property. So we got to 2019 and the market was really heating up and there was starting to be talk of a recession. And I was thinking to myself, gosh, if we're having this much trouble collecting rent from these tenants when the economy is strong, what's it going to look like in a recession? I'm not really sure that I want to stick around to find out. And at the same time, you know, we were starting, I was getting calls from brokers like every week, would you consider selling? Would you consider selling? Would you consider selling? Finally, a broker called me up one day and I was like so sick of answering the phone and talking with brokers that I said to him, yeah, I said, I'll sell if you give me this number, which I thought was such a high number that there was no way that he was, I thought he was going to laugh when I said the number and he said, let me check with my buyers and find. So he came back and said, yeah, they'll pay that. So I was like, okay, if, these, if there's somebody willing to pay more than I think these properties are worth and they're going to take on these problems, then I'll take chips off the table. My investors will be happy and, and I'll sell. And that, that's what I did. We sold the properties. We doubled everybody's money, even with the problems we had on some of the properties. And it, it looked great. It's funny. I talked with that broker just the other day. And I was like, hey, so what happened with my properties? And he told me how much they were asking for them now. <laughs> I was like, Man, I thought, I thought I got the better of them when I sold it to them, but it seems like they're having the last laugh. You never yeah. know. But I took chips off the table that my investors were happy. We went full cycle and that's, that's really what matters. It's, it's Bernard Brooks said, you never make a mistake by taking a profit. And that's how I feel. So that's very wise. And I love that you said that. So one, you're, we might be moving up the the cycle here a little bit and getting towards the end of it. And, and guys, the only way you know where the bottom is or even where the top is, you look over your shoulder and you say, there it was, right? You can't really see it coming. You can only try to read the tea leaves and predict because 
at the end of the day, what actually happens is cause and effect and emotion that, that drives the, the actual cycle. And I think that was a very wise decision, but listen to what Jonathan said there, folks, the, especially you young operators out there who are making a name for yourself in, in this tough time that it is to make a name for yourself. A, don't just chase the numbers, right? Because you're, you're probably, especially now, you're probably going to find a better cap rate on older and rougher assets, but there's a reason for that. And I think there was a big flight to quality when the cap rates got on top of each other because the question was, gee, if I have to pay a four and a half cap for a value add, I might as well buy a 2000 build property instead of a 60s build property. That's because it was the same. Now they're spread out, but you can't just look at the IRR on this. You got to look at the risk adjusted return. Think about how much harder is it going to be to collect rent. You got to think about how, what rent to income ratio is that resident base set? Has that property already been value add proposition three times this cycle? So yeah. there's a lot more things to think about, but, and, and the final point there before I'd love to pivot to, to where you're, what, what you're doing now with the hotel space, folks, if you get a chain, he, he said it beautifully, you're never going to get chastised for taking chips off the table and posting a profit. Especially if you're a young operator, take that quick win. And don't try to time it just right because having some full cycle deals under your belt, especially when it was more than you thought they'd ever be worth in your pro forma, it's still a win, even if the next guy wins as well somehow. So I love that. And listen, everybody should win, right? I'm not yeah. upset that those guys are making money. I'm happy that they're making money. I really, it's funny. I was a little bit worried about them. Are these guys really going to make money? They did. Good for them. I'm happy about that. And hopefully that's, everyone just keeps on making money as they go forward with these things. Yeah, for sure. And the only time you get in trouble in real estate, folks, you hear me say it all the time is it all boils down to you run out of time and you run out of money. Even if you don't have, if you can't time the market, don't try to just make sure you never have to sell when you don't want to. You never have to refi when you don't want to. And as Jonathan said, post a win when you can post a win. So Jonathan, let's jump over to today, right? We, they, I love the walk we've just had. So you're obviously an established operator here. You're taking a look in the hotel space and you know, this is real estate runway. I'm not biased towards multi-tenant industrial or multifamily or anything like, I just love hard assets. And so I'd love to know where you're finding yield today and what is appealing to you about the hotel industry. Yeah. So I, I got into the hotel business really in an accidental way, which is to say that, so I, I live here in New York city. My, my wife and I own a house in upstate New York very far upstate, almost like almost by Lake Ontario, not, not quite that far, but it's far. And in the, on the way to our house, we would always have to pass this hotel that was just in this spectacular location, but it was clearly like the hotel needed work, needed attention. And literally every time we passed it, we would have the same conversation, which was, isn't it a shame that nobody's done anything with this hotel? And one day I was just poking around on Crexy just to see if I could find any assets up, up there near our house to buy. Cause I, on the theory that if I had business up there, my, my wife would let me spend more time up there. <laughs> so I was just poking around to see what was going on. And lo and behold, that hotel was for sale and it had been on sale for quite some time. It had been a year. They had cut the price and cut the price and cut the price. And, and I thought, you know what? I, let me look into this. You know, knowing what I don't know, which is that I didn't know anything about hotels, I was like, okay, let me find someone who does. So through one of my business partners, it turned out that the cousin of a business partner of mine was like a second generation hotel guy and had gone out on his own running hotels and very successfully turning hotels around. We started talking. I showed him the asset. He liked it. He thought that it was a good candidate for a rehab. Once I established that, I went to just one of my investors and said, hey, what do you think of this? He said, fine. So we did the deal. We did it all cash, all the rehab and everything. And actually, we just, we're literally just putting the finishing touches on the rehab right now, but we're open for business. We've been open since the beginning of the summer and things are going great. As a result of this process of doing this first one, I felt, huh, maybe I've stumbled into something here because what? I discovered was, man, this looks a lot like multifamily did when I got into this in like 2011, 2012. You've got a lot of mom and pop operators who are not, they're not professional. They're not 
maximizing the asset. Their aim is different. Their aim is to create a lifestyle for themselves. They want to not be overworked. Obviously, they want to make a, a decent living, but they're also balancing that against how much work is involved. And in the hotel space in particular, they skew much older and they haven't adopted technology. They tend to have very old ways of doing things. Mm. And there's just a lot of meat left on the bone for these assets, not to mention the fact that they really need a lot of CapEx, right? So because typically, so as I've looked into this more, I keep on seeing the same pattern repeating itself, which is you find an asset, it's owned by an older couple or maybe their children, but that's rare because usually the kids don't want them. Yeah. Um, because they've moved away and or they don't they grew up in the hotel business, they don't want to run the hotel because they saw what their parents went through. And they did a renovation like in the 90s and they haven't renovated since. And they're not using any tech at all. So oftentimes they're taking, they're still taking reservations over the phone or back and forth via email. They tend to have the same kinds of hangups. I, I, I want to say about like a work, they don't want to overbook the hotel. And maybe this was an old, like an old hospitality thing back in the day that like they always wanted to have rooms open in case somebody just stopped by. Yeah, somebody was driving yeah. through town. They want to make sure there's a room open for them. And it's the old vacancy signs, right? That's yeah, right. But I think, but it was also <laughs> like a notion of hospitality. Like you want, you always want there to be a room for somebody there. So yeah, somehow that, that builds a business. I'm not really sure what the thought process was, but the, in any event, what we found out with our first hotel was that literally just by walking in and turning on the marketing engines and making it possible for people to get instant confirmations, we were able to boost the revenues by 20% before we even put a dime into CapEx. So that was without raising the room rates, was, that, was just by filling, the, there was more demand to be satisfied than was being filled. And then we did a couple little things just to justify some room rate increases as well, but you know, putting in coffee makers, putting in new TVs, things like that. But that really was very minimal. Then now we went into a heavy duty value add where we're able to you know, completely transform the hotel and, and then charge much higher. So we, we did the one, we're in contract on the second. And I just really like this space because I, I feel there's a lot of opportunity here for people who are willing to roll up their sleeves and do the work. And there's not a lot of competition for this kind of asset, right? For a non-stabilized value-add hotel, because there just aren't a lot of people out there who have the, this kind of skill set to evaluate the property, figure out what it needs, and then execute on the value-add, as opposed to properties that are already post-value-add where they're up and running, there's more appetite for those. But this is not the kind of asset, these aren't like five-room inns, we're talking about 40-room hotel, 70, 80-room hotel, it's not the kind of thing that somebody's going to be like, oh yeah, I'm going to retire from my job and go run a 40 room hotel when I've never run a hotel before. So you're talking about, and then to put in the money to fix it up. It's just those, that kind of audience is not there. So for an established asset, for to sell that to an established hotel operator is a much different prospect than what we do, which is we can come in and buy it and, and do the value add and bring it up to a modern standard. And that's how, so when you ask the question, how are we creating yield for our investors? That's how. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. And I have so many questions, if you'll allow me, because there's so many things I heard there. It seems like one benefit of this asset class, right? And, and I want to get to the avatar itself a little bit in a second, but because there's a lot of hotel avatars that I'm sure you have a, a mm -hmm. box that you like to buy. But in, in this is a, compared to the apartment world, right? You're typically on 12 month leases. You're typically, if it's well staggered, you have some units expiring every month and you just, you'll attempt to take them offline when they expire, renovate them, have them back within a month, things of that sort, or a couple of weeks. Here, you're literally on nightly rates. And so the, as you're laying out in your mind, how am I going to roll through a, a CapEx plan on this? Are you zoning off chunks of the hotel? Are you going room by room? And, and how long are they down? I'm, I'm just curious, like how that operational rhythm looks. Yeah, it's it really depends on the asset, right? So uh, on the first one, we did basically gut renovation down to yeah. the studs. We put in new wiring, new insulation, new plumbing, new everything. And for efficiency's sake, we wound up basically, it, well, that hotel in particular is a seasonal hotel. So it was shut down anyway during the winter months. So we just went and just started working as fast as we could 
to renovate it during those months. And there are a lot of hotels that are like that where there's either they're either shut down or they have a very slow season. So there's a natural time to go take care of that sort of thing. On, on the second hotel that we're in contract on right now, that has that's less seasonal. It does have a slow season, but it's less seasonal than the first one we did. And it's three separate buildings. So it makes it very easy for us yeah. to just do one at a time. The other advantage of the second one we're buying is it's in much better shape than the first one. We can actually run it as is. So that's our plan. We will continue to operate the hotel for cash flow as we renovate. And currently the hotel is running at a fairly low occupancy rate. Again, for the same reasons I described before, that running it really to meet their income goals as opposed to answering to investors and creating returns for someone else. So we, we think we can actually run it at a higher occupancy rate than it's currently being operated because we'll staff, have more staff and whatnot, yeah. even as we renovate. So even as we shut off one building, it's essentially not in use anyway. So we can renovate that. And then as we bring them online, we can increase the occupancy. And it's like the intellectual debate I guess we're having right now is what do we do when we have two different room types, like we've got the renovated rooms and we've got the unrenovated rooms and we haven't rebranded the hotel yet because we don't want to rebrand it until we're done. So we're going to have this sort of trans transition period where we're still operating under the old name, but where some of the rooms will be new at some point and we have to figure out how we approach that as we go. Nectar understands that raising capital is labor and time intensive and we exist to solve that problem for you. Nectar provides fast, flexible, cash flow-based financing for experienced rental owners and operators. Whether you need cash for acquiring properties, portfolios, or you simply need it for ROI generating renovations or expansion of staff, Nectar has your back. Grab your 12-month PNL with debt service and click the link in the show notes below to apply today. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And and I think my the next natural question I have for you is just like in any other asset class, there's probably 17 different types of hotel build, right? You have everything from your exterior door, two-story motel style to a 38-story JW Marriott downtown in, mm -hmm. a, in a city. W what is your buy box? What attracts you? And you mentioned mom and pop operators. That's probably a start. But are you looking for certain chain brands? Or are you just looking for one-off hotels? What's the buy look like? Yeah, that's a great question. So we do have a, a, a pretty specific idea of what kind of assets we're looking for, but you can't really put them into a, a box. It's a little okay. more conceptual. So yeah. what we're looking for is, first of all, independent, so non-branded hotels. They have to have something unique about them, right? So they can't be cookie cutter like debranded cookie cutter hotels, right? They've got to have some kind of like architectural merit or some kind of great location, or they just have to be unique in some way. They have to be special and unique because that's like the brand that we're trying to build is that they may all look different from each other, but the design will be similar and they have something compelling about them. So either the location is amazing because it's like walkable to downtown or the architecture is really distinct or the location, like the first one we did, it's got spectacular lake views. And hopefully we'll find some that'll have all three of those things. But I probably if they've got two of those things, it's going to be a winner. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. So it's less about the the physical box and, or the age or something like that. It's more about what's unique about it, what's the location like, and preferably some kind of a signature mark or, oh, that's a cool looking hotel or, or, or something of that sort. Yeah, just something that's going to stand out. Because I think what we're looking, the kind of, guest that we're looking to appeal to is the person who you know is thinking like, hey, I'm going to this location to have an experience. I don't want to just stay at the there same hotel as every other place I can go to. I really I just read my mind because my next question was, was, okay, if I'm going to Nashville, Tennessee, for example, like how do I differentiate myself as a non-name brand hotel versus the JW Marriott or someone like that. And what you just said there is, and so let me venture an example. What if somehow you found a guitar shaped hotel close to downtown Nashville that might fit your bill versus just another hotel building that's going to be lost in the holiday ends and the Hilton garden ends and all that kind of stuff from a marketing perspective. Is that, is that the idea? Yeah, exactly. That That's a good example. That might not be, be, be the avatar, but that's the idea. <laughs> yeah. I, I think in our case, it might be something more like 
a little more like Mad Men, right? It's mid-century modern, kind of cool design sort of thing where we can, because that's like the aesthetic that we're going for at the yeah. rooms. It's a bit more of a modern, mid-century modern kind of look. And, and we do hope that at some point we get to the point where people are like, oh, there's a Hotel Laurel here. Well, I didn't know that. Because we do also want to, part of our sort of plan is to try to build out in a relatively targeted geographical area. Okay. Partly for just logistical reasons, but also for for branding. Yeah, I love that. So I've got, I think, two more questions for you. because This is super interesting. I'm loving this, this conversation. I don't have a lot of hotel guys on the show, so this is a cool conversation. Let's talk about management for a minute. Mm -hmm. as Just comparing it to the, the mean average, which would be an apartment building, more turnover, marketing, probably not a lot of, and maybe I'm wrong, probably not a lot of like third-party management companies. So how do you set these up for success and find what are the technologies you need to have? What does it look like to staff it? Like, like how do, do you guys run the hotel at that level or do you have a third party? What does that look like in the hotel industry? Yeah, just drawing on my past experience, there are third party hotel management companies out there. Okay. They tend to be more institutional, right? Okay. So they're, they're the companies that are often managing the branded hotels. So we actually do the management in house for ourselves. So we're in the process of, so my partner is really the operations guy, right? Yeah. The kind of deal structuring finance vision guy, I want to say. He's more on the nuts and bolts, like yep. getting all the stuff done on time person, as well as running the hotel. We actually have staff that we employ directly and under his supervision. One of the challenges going forward would be to build out an infrastructure of regional managers on top of managers once we get to the point where we need that. But in terms of some of your other sort of operational questions, yeah, there's, it, it is obviously more management intensive in, this, in the sense that your guests are staying for a night or two. You've got to have staff on there to clean and turn rooms, right? But of course, a turn for a hotel is cleaning and vacuuming. It's not right. repainting and, and all the stuff that you have to do with an apartment turn. So it's obviously a much lighter turn and they, they can do it in a few hours. One of the interesting things about hotel operation is that your costs, there are a lot more variable costs than there are with multifamily. Okay. Right? Because your occupancy, higher occupancy makes your costs higher and lower occupancy makes your costs lower because you say you're not cleaning rooms, you're not restocking rooms if fewer people are staying. You don't have to, during the slow season, you're hiring less people. A lot of the staff is part-time hour, hourly and they're they work on a seasonal basis. So it's not like multifamily where if your occupancy drops to 90% from 95, you're not like, oh, we can fire our maintenance guy now because we're only at 95%. It doesn't, your, your costs are much more fixed in multifamily. So that was one of the things that was interesting for me to learn because I think like a lot of people, I was a little bit intimidated by hotels before I got into it because it's, oh, it's an operating business and it's much, much more complicated. It's, it is slightly more complicated, but it is not, once you get into it, intimidatingly complicated. And, and there's a lot of things that technology allows you to do better now than you could do. For instance, like marketing is something that is now a lot easier to do for hotels because of Expedia and TripAdvisor and all of those online booking services that you can do your marketing through. It just makes the world easier and levels the playing field a little bit with the flagged hotels for the independents because they're on the same booking engines, right? That's also helps. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. And I guess last question for you, Jonathan, because having talked through all that, you mentioned the first one you bought, you pretty much took it down in cash. I don't know if the second one you're buying, if you're looking at financing or not, but I'm just curious from a deal structure perspective, are you looking at primarily taking these down in cash due to high variability of cash flow in the early days? Or are you looking at, are there good financing products out there for these? Like, In your opinion, how do you put that deal together in your mind? Yeah, so that is definitely... A work in progress, I'd say. So the first one I did in all cash because I really, I, I was a little bit anxious about yeah. taking on debt and, and wanted to make it as low risk as possible. We did that one all cash. We're definitely looking to finance the second one. The financing environment is definitely less robust than for multifamily, let's say. There, there are fewer options and especially in a market like this. There really isn't uh, you know, bank debt available for value add. Are you really going with bridge debt or seller financing? I've become a big fan of seller financing since I got into this. Never really understood the value of seller financing before. Now I really get it. 
But one of the things also I have been thinking about is to try to make it possible to scale this is maybe looking at raising a fund so that we can buy deals for cash and then stabilize them ourselves and then do cash out refinances once they're stabilized or use a combination of cash and seller financing so that, because I think it'll just be a lot easier to execute that way than using bridge debt or yeah. you know, trying to bang your head against the wall with banks. So that's probably the direction that we're moving. Yeah, that's a great, it's a great way to think about it. And folks like bridge debt comes with it, a lot of covenants and, and a very fine line you have to walk to make sure money keeps flowing. Ask me how I know I've been of the ups and downs in that world. And so that is, that's something to be used with caution, but to, to, the point of what Jonathan just mentioned is, look, if you don't really know what you're doing in the beginning, but it, mitigating your risk is good. And that is maybe you don't know how the cash flow variability is going to be. You, you just don't trust your underwriting quite yet. Taking it down with cash is a great way to do that because you maximize your staying power. Now you probably minimize your earning power, but if you're getting, if you're getting that good of a basis on this project, if it's a true mom and pop and you're able to do massive increases on the net operating income of this project, doesn't really matter. You're still going to do fine either way. And then I love what you said at the end there, Jonathan, about talking about a fund. Uh, you know, we're doing that right now. We've observed <laughs> that the, look, if you want to get any sort of construction financing or bridge debt, you're pretty much floating over an index and it's going to cost you uncapped nine to 13% right now, best case. And so it's, gee, there's a lot of private capital out there that's really happy with eight or 9% even today. And, and, and that's the challenge is, is these transactions he's talking about, and, and, and I'm actually looking at applying this to small multifamily that people don't pay as much attention to, is look, if you can solve the operational and scale problems, and, and you now have the ability with a fund to go in and buy them for cash, you're going to be a heck of a lot more efficient even paying your investors 8 or 9% on a debt fund and, and buying things that way than you are going to be trying to do small loans. It, it's exponentially harder to get a million-dollar loan for something unstabilized than it is to get a $20 million loan for something unstabilized. So it's just, it's funny how that works and it baffles me, but I guess it's probably because the failure rate is just higher, the less savvy the operators. That's, and there's to get a lender out of bed to go, to go deploy a million dollars, they're going to need a higher yield, not as pound for pound, it doesn't yield them as much. So very interesting concept, Jonathan, if you're open to it, I'd love to lead into the Quattro questions before we leave here. And uh, yeah, would love to, and happy to jump into your Quattro Quattro round now. Yeah, there we go. Here we go. So question number one, Jonathan, what is your superpower? And it could be life or business and how does it serve you? So one thing I've always been really good at is connecting people. So I've developed a reputation amongst the people that I know that I could pretty much introduce you to anybody that you need to be introduced to. And if I don't know that person, like I know somebody who knows that person. So I'm really good with connecting people. And then another thing I think you kind of, from this conversation, maybe you can see it. I just really love and really feel like I'm good at spotting value that other people are overlooking. I That's why I got into multifamily in the first place. When I got into it, it wasn't really the, the same kind of, there, it was not the, the craze around it that you see now. It was, there were definitely people looked at me a little bit of side eye when I said what I was doing. And I like that. And I like- Investment views, right? Yeah. And I like the fact that even amongst those people, I was looking in the Carolinas, but everybody else was looking in Texas, right? And I was saw the value in the Carolinas that hadn't been noticed yet. So I, I like that, and I I feel the same way with the with this independent hotel space. So there you go. Yeah, that's beautiful, Jonathan. And and flipping the coin over, what is your biggest failure in life or business? And give me some lessons you learned from it. Oh my God, there are too many of those to count. But one one big failure in the real estate business is that early on, I made the mistake of believing it when gurus say, if you find a great deal, the money will find you. I had, it was actually four deals in already at that point, but I did find a, I found a great deal. It was right near an asset I already owned. It was actually from a seller that I had bought from before that did good re So I was actually buying from rehabbers, right? Yeah. And, and it was, they did a good job on the first asset we bought. So I was really excited to buy this one. And but my, at the time, I was like over, overly reliant on a couple of big investors, and both of them were out of this deal for reasons that had nothing to do with the deal. There were personal or business reasons why they just were not in this deal. And I didn't really have a lot of other investors at that point. 
I and the partners I was working on the deal with were like, it's a great deal. They say, if we have a great deal, the money will, will come. And we went out and we beat the bushes and the money did not show up. And, and it was very difficult. We had to buy an extension of time. I had to let some of my deposit go hard to get extra time. We spent a lot of time talking to some private equity fund or something that just gave us a runaround and didn't come through at the end. And it was a kind of uh, searing experience, let's say, having gotten, just having found a great deal that we could not take down. And that was really tough. But I learned some good lessons from that. I don't know if you want to get into that, but I definitely, there are definitely some things I learned as a result of that deal. I think it's worth touching if you have a moment. I know we may go a few minutes over, but it's a great road to walk here. <laughs> what I learned is you got to go build your investor list, right? You can't rely on that statement that the money will come. So I really spent a lot of time after that, spending time on social media, on building a list, building a Facebook group, doing podcasting, doing all the things that, that one does to build a list. And now I'm at the point where I don't you know, have that problem anymore, but it was, yeah. it was a bad experience, I'll tell you. And let's diagnose why that is, folks. To, for anyone to invest with you, they have to know and trust you first. If they don't know you, they have no chance to like and trust you. And what I will tell you is if you, it's very rare that you meet someone for the first time and you're able to make an ask and them still trust you. Because usually, okay, I can tell you need me more than I need you. And they're usually out at that point. So it's like being able to build that relationship over time when you don't need something or you don't have an offering for them. It, it's more of a let the barriers come down because then if you're ever acting out of desperation, if you chase money, it runs, folks, whether that's money you're trying to make or money you're trying to raise, you chase it, it will run. So I, I love that, Jonathan. It's a great point. And I, I do believe if you have a good deal, they will come, but you better already have the list for them to come from. <laughs> exactly. Yes. That's the piece that's always left out, right? Yeah. If you build the list, then they will come. But if you haven't built the list first, then... Yeah. It's a lot tougher. Not to say impossible, but it's a lot tougher. Right. A lot tougher, for sure, for sure. Tell me about this. So you have a, a gift for the audience here, and it's a particular document I think you're willing to share with them. Tell us what that is and where they can find it. Sure. So I guess for those of you, I don't know if this is going to go up on YouTube or not. I can show it. It will, yes. So, all right. So this is actually what you can get, and I'll describe it for those listening. So this is the ultimate checklist. This is a guide to buy your first 100 unit plus deal with other people's money and get paid to do it. And this is basically a checklist of it's 57 pages long, although there's a lot of big tech, this, it's big type. Basically walks you through every single step of buying a multifamily deal and syndicating it. If you have ever wondered what's involved in this, this will just tell you, you can just read through this document and it literally lays out every single step for you to follow when you're syndicating a deal. So the way you can get this is go to my website, which is apartmentinvestorsclub.com and just click on the button, give us your email address and this will be emailed to you automatically. And you'll have the benefit of being added to my email list on top of it, which you, know, you can unsubscribe to as soon as you get the checklist if you want, but that's free for you if you're interested. And folks, that is tremendous value. And I'll give you a spoiler alert. While not everything in that list is going to apply to every commercial deal out there, some will be multifamily specific. A good chunk of what's in there, I'd venture to say 60 or 70% at least, is going to apply to most commercial deals. So whether you're talking about buying a hotel, buying a, a triple net lease building, take it, give it a read. Just because it says multifamily, don't be fooled, okay? Jonathan, last question. If any of our audience wants to reach out to you, uh, maybe talk more about hotels or any other offerings you're doing, what's the best way to get in touch with you, get on your email list, stuff like that? You can get on the email list automatically if you go get the download, but if you don't want the download, the best thing to do is Google Two Bridges Asset Management LLC. So it's Two Bridges Asset Management LLC, and there's an investor form that you can fill out if you want to join my investor list, and there's a contact form you can fill out if you just want to contact us. So please reach out. I'm happy to, always happy to talk with people about real estate, multifamily, hotels, whatever's on your mind. I love talking with investors. Reach out if you have a chance. Love it, Jonathan. Thank you so much for coming on, providing all this value in the hotel space. And uh, I hope in a couple of months, maybe we'll get to have you back on and just hear about some of the progress and successes you're having in the contrarian investment space that is mom and pop hotels. Absolutely. Thanks for, very much for having me. This was fun. Do you manage multiple legal entities? Is your data scattered across various unsecure systems? Is your team spending too much time on manual processes? 
Do you struggle to meet reporting deadlines? Simplify entity management and compliance with Entity Keeper. Entity Keeper helps easily manage entities, build and maintain complex organizational charts, and track filing deadlines, all in one secure, cloud-based platform. And with automated alerts and centralized document storage, you'll stay two steps ahead of compliance deadlines. Click the link in the show notes to learn more and book a demo. All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed that show with Jonathan Twombly today with Two Bridges Asset Management. We really had a great conversation about how he's investing in small mom and pop hotels that meet a certain unique avatar and how he's really just focusing on improving operations to get revenue up and therefore increase the value of the property. Folks, if you got any value out of the show, check us out on social media. We are everywhere. Real Estate Runway Podcast on YouTube and TikTok or Team Quattro Capital on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, all those things. Check it out in the show notes right there for your viewing pleasure. Pay it forward, ladies and gentlemen. If you got any value out of the show and you think someone else might get value out of the show, hit that share button, send it to a buddy, or just interact with the show. The only way we get seen more is by you interacting and giving us a five-star review or a comment or a like or a thumbs up and saying, hey, I enjoy what they're putting out here. So make sure more people just like you get to listen to the show. And we so appreciate you for it. And folks, check it out. We are a real estate investment firm here at Quattro Capital. If we can help you in any way, or you'd like to have a conversation, see how you can take advantage of some of our offerings. Let's build a relationship, see where we go from there. Check us out at the quattroway.com slash invest to sign up and see where to go from there. So this has been another episode of the Real Estate Runway Podcast, folks. Until next time, over and out. We hope this episode was insightful and brought value to your day. If so, please be awesome and leave us a five-star review. Find out how Team Quattro can help you at thequattroway.com. Until next time, this is the Real Estate Runway Podcast.